Well, not everyone shares Mr. Azarad's opinions on the distribution of wealth here in the United States, especially my next two guests. Kate Ritchie is with the Oklahoma Policy Institute, where she studied the state's growing income gap, while Ryan Kiesel is a former state lawmaker who now heads up the Oklahoma chapter of the ACLU. Ryan Kiesel, Kate Ritchie, thank you so much for being here. Well, my first question is kind of an open-ended one. Is it harder to be in the middle class in Oklahoma today than it was in years past? It is. I definitely think it is in terms of the room that the average family has in their budget, it's harder. People make less money um, in real terms and their es essential items that they have to buy are more expensive. So Ryan, why is that? I think that we've seen a shift in the burden of subsidizing state expenses and services. Um, in the last several years, we've seen attempts, and this year we saw the passage of a tax cut that's going to benefit disproportionately higher income earners in the state of Oklahoma. But to keep up the illusion of continuing to provide state services, we've shifted the cost of a lot of those services in the form of fees under those very individual families that are less capable of, of paying for that. And so while we've seen uh, income inequality grow, we've also seen a reduction in services that allow middle income and lower income families to get a foothold in the economy. Are either one of you as concerned about what's happening to the upper income individuals as to what's happening to lower and middle class? And by what that, do you care if the rich are getting richer? I mean, I, I care in the, in this, if it's at the expense of people who don't have enough to subsist. So if the rich are getting richer on the backs of working people who at the end of the day can't take care of their children or pay their bills or put food on the table, then yeah, I care. I don't think that that is anything that most Americans or most Oklahomans would call fair, and, and it's unnecessary. If you have um, enough money and, and sufficient assets and you work hard for them and your upper income, you deserve it. You know, There's no reason why anybody who is, is upper income in that way doesn't deserve what they have or, or isn't entitled to it. But um, if it is done at the expense of and in, with total disregard for the needs of others, then I, I don't think that's acceptable. From a policy perspective? Yeah, I think studies have shown that Americans realize that there's going to be some inequality. Um, you know, if, if, we, if everyone were equal, we would have uh, you know, what you know, most economists would consider some sort of socialism. We don't want that, apparently. Um, but I think that most Americans realize there's going to be some inequality. However, I think most Americans and most Oklahomans would be surprised to see how um, radical and extreme that inequality has become. And so it's, it's not necessarily a matter of not caring about uh, the fact that the very wealthiest Americans and uh, the one percent of those wealthiest Americans um, are monopolizing much more of our nation's wealth than at any time in our nation's history. Um, but as Kate said, it's coming at the expense of the lower income. Um, and frankly, while I wouldn't say that I don't care um, about the higher income folks, they have access to the political means to um, have, have their voices heard in state legislatures and in Congress that lower income Americans and Oklahomans just simply don't have at their disposal. So does this boil down to the fact that maybe the lower income Americans or lower income Oklahomans just do not have the same constituency that higher income people would? Uh, absolutely they don't. And higher income Americans um, and Oklahomans need to realize that it's in their best interest to have a strong middle class. You know, at some point, the disparity that we're realizing between lower income and working class Oklahomans and the higher income Oklahomans that, that's going on in our state right now will catch up with our state's overall economy. Um, we've already seen examples of where that's impacted our economy, both at the state and the national level. The real estate bubble uh, and the lending crisis that uh, was the catalyst for the, for the latest economic meltdown that we saw at a global level uh, had its roots in economic inequality. And so even those folks at the very high income levels, they have an interest in ensuring um, that the inequality that's going to exist in any sort of a capitalist economy is an, equality, is, a, is an inequality that's not to the extremes that we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. I would agree with both on both counts. I think that low income people do not have as much, nearly as much representation that's coming from you know, someone who works every day uh, representing the interests of low and, and middle income working Oklahomans. Their priorities, um, both because they work 
during the day, you know, work one or two jobs, you don't have time to go down to the Capitol or call the newspaper or, um, you know, gain as much knowledge or education about whatever policy issue that might be best for you and your family. It, there's just so much time and energy that they would have to invest in that and they don't have that because they're working just to earn, you know, a subsistence wage. So. We definitely see in the work that we do as a voice for our low and middle income Oklahomans, we're often a, a sole voice um, representing them. It's definitely true. And at the same time, Ryan is right. It is in everybody's best interest that everybody makes enough money to get by. And when we have these yawning, growing gaps in income and wealth, um, over time, um, the people at the top and people who earn the most and have the most assets will begin to see that erode and deteriorate in a variety of ways. Pri the primary way is that everyone else is a consumer of either the goods that they produce um, and is a pr participating in the economy that they're invested in. So when you have this large weight at the bottom that can no longer purchase goods, that can no longer pay taxes, that n needs help you know, putting food on the table needs to be enrolled in a social program that creates a weight on the economy that will drag everybody down eventually. And when, we, when we talk about constituencies, we're, we're talking about political constituencies that exercise power in a couple of ways. The, the higher income Americans exercise power predominantly through money and the influence that money has on elections and politics uh, I think is no secret to anyone. Um, but lower income and working uh, uh, class Oklahomans and Americans have traditionally exercised their political power through organization. And what we've seen is a concerted effort over the last several years to limit the political power of low-income Americans in Oklahomans. And we've seen that through voter ID laws that disproportionately impact the political power of low-income folks. And we've also seen it through the elimination of early voting. Kate said people don't have time to go to the Capitol and lobby their legislators because they're out working. Well, you know, having one or two days to participate in an election is also a burden for some folks. Uh, we can have all the laws protecting voters in the world, but for some people, they just cannot afford to take that time to go sit uh, at a polling place, especially if they have long lines. So rather than expanding opportunities so that our electorate is more representative of the entire uh, population and the entire <clears throat> everyone in the economy, uh, what we're seeing is a concerted effort to limit that constituency and limit their political power. It, could income inequality, could it be self-perpetuating in the fact that it's harder for someone that is poor to get the education that they may need or some of the mm -hmm. skills training that they may need? That's definitely true. So this is the third year in Oklahoma that the state has defunded adult education. The state now appropriates zero dollars to GED prep classes, basic math and literacy, and ESL. So. Two, I think $2.3 million, we spent the same amount for about 10 years, which enables in every county in Oklahoma, somebody who wants to gain the basic skills either to get a entry level job or maybe to go on to career tech or to college, they can get that for a very little cost. Um, that is will soon be a thing of the past in Oklahoma. We are not investing in providing the opportunity that folks that are very low income need. And it doesn't cost very much to make those public resources available. Um, but for somebody who is does not have the skills to get even an entry level job or maintain a minimum wage job, there there is no way to step up. There's no stair for them to step up the economic ladder if that if it's not uh, if we don't invest in that. And when we think about is it harder, is it self-perpetuating, I think it's self-perpetuating for a larger number of Oklahomans today. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that uh, if for no other uh, illustration is that the middle in uh, income family that used to be able to send their kid to college um, and have their kid graduate from college without any debt, now we're seeing middle income families where college education, which is almost a requisite for, the ser for a lot of these service industry jobs that are the kinds of jobs that allow you to get ahead, um, has been priced out of the market, or people graduate with staggering amounts of student loan debt. Student loan debt now combined surpasses consumer credit debt in our country. I, I we think, have one of the highest student loan default rates in the country. Yeah. Oklahoma. Here in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Really. So, are there solutions? I think so. I think investing in those front end um, public structures that provide anybody 
uh, whether you are very, very low income, middle income, upper income, everybody should have access to, if they want to get ahead, have access to basic means to get there. Okay, Richie, Ryan Kiesel, thank you both for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you.